You are now listening to the Going North Podcast, where you'll receive tips and techniques to advance yourself. I'm your host, Dom Brightman, and every week we're going to be hearing from an author who's going to share their expertise to help you charge forward in life. On a quick side note, be sure to check out Going North, the book. It's available in ebook, audio, as well as paperback form for those who love to read a traditional book. Now let's get on with the show. Today on the Going North Podcast, we have a non-author. I was messing with you. We got another author on the show today. And this wonderful author right here is a fellow Baltimorean, provide Baltimore listeners here. And we have a wonderful lady right here who has a Bachelor's of Art in English. And she also has some background and master's in early childhood education from the wonderful Towson University in Maryland. This wonderful lady is retired, and she lives in Baltimore with her two wonderful daughters, and she just entered the business of immortality with her first ever book titled Defying the Verdict. Some of you probably wondered who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the wonderful CCB, Miss Sharita Cole Brown. How are you today, ma'am? I am fine, Don. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing fabulous. Yay. Yeah. So it made the introduction pretty short, but mind filling in the gaps where I may have missed some things? Well, the book is called Defying the Verdict, My Bipolar Life. In 1982, as a student at Wesleyan University, it was my senior year. I was scheduled to graduate in May. I had a psychotic break. My parents took me home, went home to Baltimore, went to a therapist who said, given the severity and frequency of my episodes, I would probably end up in custodial care, meaning I would need a custodian at some point in life to take care of me. And the book is about why I didn't end up that way. Uh, yes, indeed. A great book, indeed, and an easy read, too. The, the chapters are like five to nine pages a piece, so it's a quick read, and it gets, and it's just really easy to read and very well written, I might add. Thank you. And the, the readability is intentional because it's not going to make a difference to people if they can't get through it, if it's U- Ulysses. They're not going to be able to read it. <laughs> it's true. So what gave you the confidence to finally publish this work? Because a lot of folks, they may be going through mental illness, especially being bipolar, and they may not have the confidence to actually write about it, and more importantly, actually go public and share it with the world. So what really just drove you to be confident and just share your story with the world? In 2009, I read this prompt, this, this writing prompt from Joyce Meyer. And it said, what is your one? And I thought about it, prayed about it, and I decided that my one was to write a memoir. And so that was in 2009, and the book is coming to the world in 2018. Because for me, it is important to let people know that mental illness is something that exists and that you can live a good life with a mental illness diagnosis if you do what you have to do. And the basic point of the book, Don, is, you know, if somebody reads this and sees themselves in it in in any way, that they can understand that if you do the right things, you can be all right. Amen, indeed. I actually enjoy learning the fun fact that both our dads actually served in the Korean War. Really? Okay, yeah, that's dad. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yep, I'd underline that one and write that down. I'm like, oh, shoot, this is a small world indeed. Both the <laughs> Baltimore authors and both were dads fought in the Korean War. It's like, oh, this is amazing. That is, that's an interesting, uncommon commonality. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't yeah. know, Don, if many people even picked up on that. <laughs> As they read. 
Oh, yeah. When you read a book, you got to read a book. You got to feel it. You got to feel it in your soul. Well, some some books you don't want to do that. I mean, uh, some books talk about killing and whatnot, and they get deep into the mystery. You don't want to be the victim, but, but you got to feel it. So what really led to just listing a quote in the beginning for one separate page and then just starting with one of my favorite quotes is the Marianne Williamson quote. And, of course, with the combination with the Bible, I mm-hmm. guess, leads to a lot of things. So what really led just the combination of just combining the Bible with a little bit of, I wouldn't say Eastern, but different philosophies? Well, I am one of those people, because I'm a writer, I love quotes and so when I started writing the book, for me, it was natural to use quotations. And like for some of the chapters, I wrote the chapter and I didn't have a quotation. And then I looked for a quotation that I thought fit that particular chapter. But I love the idea. For example, my book begins with hospital records so that you are hit with the reality that this is a real illness. And that book starts with the James Baldwin quote, stare the rat down. Because James Baldwin said that his mom taught him that if you stare at a rat, it'll run from you and it won't have power over you. True indeed, especially the quotes from the greats, heck, like Socrates, but more importantly, from the writers of the Bible. Yes, and the thing is, what you were saying, the quotes are from different places. Like I have a quote from Zora Neale Hurston because I read a lot of different things, and I, I was an English major. So you have a lot of influence from different places. So a lot of those things came together. I think Chapter 11 is a quote from my now 15-year-old niece, but she was 10 at the time. It was, get up, you are not defeated. Cameron Little is my my 15-year-old niece. Uh, So I guess she keeps you energized and curious. (laughs) Yes, and she's really proud, too. She's she's really proud. She said in her Spanish class, they were supposed to say, you know, mi tia is something. And she said that her tia was an author. And she was so proud. She said everybody else's tia was like a doctor, a teacher, you know, a nurse. But her tia was not. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, you had had alluded to the difficulty of um, writing this. It was very hard to go back because a lot of the stuff I had buried. So it was hard to go back and deal with things but sometimes it's important and this is not original it's important to reveal so that you can heal and so that other people can heal looking at what you've given light to reveal so that you can heal is that going to be a (laughs) t-shirt that might that might be a good idea i don't remember who said it as i said i carry all these quotes in my head sometimes i think When I speak, I should just do big quotation marks around me because I use other people's stuff. (laughs) So instead of the bunny ears on your head around Easter time, just put some quotations around your head. (laughs) One of my favorite chapters in the book was the chapter on friendship in chapter 12 and mentioned the question where he asked, Benny is like, why did you continue to support me and all my craziness? How does it feel to really know that you really have someone who would actually be there with you despite some of the signs that you were showing of bipolar? That's my girlfriend, Gloria Penny Mullings, and she actually now lives in, we went to college together, she now lives in England. It really is something to have a person support you because almost nobody gets well by themselves. So... Most people who you see who have reached a level of leading a good life have somebody that supports them. So I have had Penny, my friend. I've had some other friends. And I have my wonderful family. There are families that walk out because they're afraid of the illness. But my family kind of circled the wagons and dealt with me, as did Penny, which was your which was your question. You and I have some other 
some other friends. I have my friend Joanne. I have my friend now, a more recent friend, my friend Desiree. I have other, like my church members who have really supported me along this journey. Beautiful indeed. So will there ever be your book signing planned in England? We are hoping to be able to do that, actually. She and I have talked about that. We are hoping that we, can, we will be able to set something up for a congregation in Great Britain. Because, you know, another thing that, we talk, that I talked about in the book is that for Christian people, a lot of times people just want to pray mental illness away. And it's not something that you can just pray away. And I pray a lot. But if you really have, you know, I have a genetic illness. If I had um, cancer, you wouldn't tell me to pray it away. If I broke my arm, you wouldn't say, Sharita, don't get that set. Just pray that away. So at church settings, people that believe God, sometimes we have to shift our paradigm so that we can help people who are hurting within our congregations as well. Kind of reminds me of a classic saying, prayer without works is dead. (laughs) Yes, faith without works is dead. And um, there is a preacher who I love, and I find myself quoting him a lot. His name is um, Bishop Michael Rogers. He has a church in Virginia. And he said in a message that I heard, faith means do something. And that's something that I have really internalized. If you really believe, you know your faith is shown by your works. So you got to do something. Faith means doing something. Amen, indeed. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, my goodness. You can't just be on your knees all day praying without doing anything. Uh, well, you could. And, you know, and it's, there's, there's nothing wrong with continual prayer. And there are people who give their lives to that. You know, that's what their lives are about. Probably some of those people, people are keeping our world doing well, those people who are devoted their lives to prayer. But those of us who that is not our purpose, we have to, you know, for me, I have to say, or I chose to say what I have done in hopes that I could help somebody else do what they need to do. That's true indeed. And that was eventually going to be your path, originally going to be a nun, right, in the earlier chapters, one of the original goals? Who? Oh, no, not me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, not me, not me. It, the nuns had a lot to do with my life, but oh, no, not me. Uh-uh. I had at one point said I was going to be a priest because, you know, women couldn't be a priest. So, But that's, as they say, that's another way for another day. <laughs> Probably another way north. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other group that we talk about a lot in the book, for me, there are three things about me. The fact that I am an African-American woman, the, the fact that I am, that I got sick when I was a young adult, which is like a, the median age for bipolar And then we just talked about the Christian thing. But moving to, you know, minorities, minorities are very resistant to mental health care. And we find that in the book, we find Christians resistant, we find African Americans resistant, and that's one of the things that this book is about. It's about curing stigma, and it's about helping people to understand, do what you have to do to live the healthy life, the the maximum life that you can live. You know, or is, what does Oprah say, live your best life? Is that the, is that an Oprah tagline? We'll, we'll give her credit for it. She's, she's like, she's inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> she won't be mad. <laughs> you know, everybody, we all have a tagline. <laughs> You know, it's like I like the the thing from from Hamilton, the musical, that is who lives, who dies, who tells your story. And so mine is who lives, who dies, I'll tell my story. Amen. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, as, you know, as, as you're saying, story is such a wonderful thing because people love to hear stories. So I've now included mine in the 
the business of immortality. Yes, and I never, I never thought about that. You know, um, Don, that's a little frightening to think that it's the. No one ever put it to me like that because I remember before I, as I was editing the book, I was saying to a couple of my friends who were, I had a prayer team for the book, so I was saying to a couple of my friends slash prayer people that it was scary to me because it was once I it was published, it was out there. It wasn't like if I say it, the words are there, but it's not permanently connected. And I came to the conclusion that this is a good thing. Especially when you have a dedicated team and folks spread the good word about your book, it'll live long after you're gone. I mean, the Bible, if I can grow rich, then there's the Harry Potter series. <laughs> 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 oh, my goodness. I was really surprised to find out. My daughter was like, Mommy, you didn't know how many books? I was looking at a listing of books that had sold the most in the world, and Harry Potter is like third or fourth on the list. You know, it's like behind the Tolkien books. It's Of course, it's behind the Bible, but it's I don't remember it's behind something else, but it's like fourth on the list. And my daughter was like, Mommy, you didn't realize that Harry Potter was – Basically, the sensation that it was. I knew it was a big thing, but I didn't know it had sold like that. <laughs> yeah, J.K. Rowling, if she wasn't charitable, she'd be a billionaire. That's, that's how profitable her book series is. <laughs> yeah, but, you, you know, it's, it's important for her. You know, she was able to really give children a fantasy world. And for my book, it's not giving anybody a fantasy world. It's giving them reality because... People had suggested to me that I fictionalize my book as other people have done because it allows you to add stuff to your story, and it also allows you to distance yourself somewhat from your story. But for me, I knew, and I cried about it, I knew that people needed to look at my book and look at me, the real person, and see that I am doing very, very well. Because people need that actual role model. Folks need role models for all sorts of things nowadays because folks are discovering new and new things. They are discovering new disabilities and renaming some new things. And we're going to be needing folks out there who are maybe going through the same thing and they are actually yeah. an image of success on how to deal with that and thrive with it to not just deal with the situation, but actually thrive in that situation. So it's good that you actually decided to live your story, be your story, and tell your story. I like that. You said live your story, be your story, and tell your story. Did you come up with that yourself? Oh, no. that one I borrowed that one from my coach buddies, Sir Charles Carey. He had a near-death experience with cancer and leukemia. And oh, my goodness. He, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and he had jaundice as well. He, he was very sick, but he was able to overcome it and actually become a multiple-time published author and even got on a TV show called The Keynote. So I borrowed that from him. Wow, that's pretty impressive and amazing. That's really something. And that is important because people need to know that things can be okay, even if you've had a dire situation, which... You know, when I dug all this stuff back and looked at my story, it was really tough. I really went through a hard time. But as I, I said, I had my book launch recently. The book isn't out yet, but I had a book launch. And, then, and at my book launch, I said, one of the things I said was, but God. You know, there are you know, other things, but God. Yes, indeed. Speaking of thriving in a place where you are now and getting all of this momentum is there any particular piece of advice that you want to give to someone in particular who may be bipolar or may have a relative who's bipolar? First advice for someone who is bipolar. My advice is understand that you are not your illness. Nobody would tell you that you are diabetes, that you are cancer, that you are a broken arm. You have a mental illness. You don't have to let that mental illness define you. What you owe yourself is to learn as much as you possibly can about the illness and do the things that you need to do to be and stay well 
If it means not drinking, don't drink. If it means take your medicine, take your medicine. But learn what you need to do to stay healthy. If it means change completely the way you eat, then change completely the way you eat. Love yourself enough first to do what needs to be done. That's my advice for, of course, I I would have some more, but that's the shorter version of advice to someone with the illness, that you're not the illness. Amen, indeed. Because you're right. I mean, if someone walks around with a sling in their arm, they're not going to say, hey, how's it going, broken arm? How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> But what, because of the stigma about mental illness, people don't understand mental illness, and people are afraid of it. And so because people are afraid of it, we don't deal with it. And so for me, it was tough to put the book out in my name because there are, of course, people who know that I struggle with mental illness. But I've been in recovery for nearly 30 years now. So the people that don't know don't know. And, you know, I really didn't want to put out, oh, she's crazy, so people could say, well, hmm, I thought that all along. But sometimes we have to bite the bullet. And you can just be the catalyst for others to get the confidence to write their stories as well. Yes. And even if you don't write your story, it's the thing about telling your story and bringing your story to life. You know, you have Demi Lovato, who is bipolar. You have Mariah Carey, who is bipolar. You have, I don't know if everyone would know about Margot Kidder, who played Lois Lane in Superman with Christopher Reeve, the old Lois, the, the original Lois Lane on screen. She was bipolar. And she talked about her illness because she had had a very, like, public manic episode where she ended up in somewhere in L.A., I don't know if it was the Bowery, but with broken teeth and just having a horrible psychotic episode. And she got it back on the rails. She had people who loved her. She went on to live, she died recently, but she went on to live a life where she was still in movies, open about what she went through. That's right, reveal to heal. Well, speaking of powerful things, I'm pretty sure there are some powerful books that have really inspired you to continue to write. Do you mind sharing any titles with us that are your favorites? Sure. I think um, a title that is like everybody's favorite, and she blurbed my book, is Kay Jamison's An Unquiet Mind. And for those who don't know, Kay Jamison is one of the foremost authorities on bipolar disorder in the world. And she wrote textbook for medical students on manic depressive disorder, which is what we now call bipolar disorder. I was blessed to have her have her blurb my book, so there's an unquiet mind. There's a book called The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. And in The Glass Castle, Jeanette's dad was an alcoholic, and her mother appeared to suffer with borderline personality disorder. Her mother appeared to suffer with borderline personality disorder, but it was never said that directly about her. So that really touched me. Terry Cheney's book, Manic. Monica Coleman, who is an African-American teacher and reverend, wrote the book Bipolar Faith. And so that's a, that's a great book for someone who wants to know to listen to some a woman of color who also is bipolar. Now Monica Coleman suffered with bipolar two, which is different from bipolar one that I was diagnosed with. And I can explain that if you want me to. Sure. Up, down, up, down, and that's a bipolar illness that I displayed. A lot of times you have depression, as you saw in the book, before you ever start having manias, the highs. So I had the lows first, which is classic, but it's up, down, up, down. You get them both. With bipolar 2, you get more depression, and if you ever have a high that never hits the psychotic level, but you have all this energy, maybe you're not sleeping, those kinds of things, then you are diagnosed as bipolar 2. 
And then we get into, you know, what do we do as far as treatment? Yeah, especially with the yeah, because treatment is very important, especially with the difference between the bipolar one and the bipolar two. Now, the interesting thing, Don, about treatment is that psychiatric illnesses. Um, everybody responds differently to different things. It's like if you have cancer, everybody doesn't do chemo. Some people do radiation. Some people do a combination. Some people, you know, it's, it depends on because um, cancer treatment is further along than treatment for bipolar disorder. So there are different things that you can do. But for bipolar treatments, you don't really know what's going to work. Now, I was very fortunate. There was a drug that they came up with in the 50s that is called lithium, that my grandmother, who is, who was bipolar manic depressive, and my great uncle, her brother, they didn't have that. Like their lives would fall apart, and then they'd have to pull their lives back together. My, my mom was raised by an actively bipolar woman and was abandoned a couple times in her life, not because my grandmother wasn't a lovely woman, because she's in the book, and she was delightful, when she was when she was well, but she wasn't always well, and there was nothing for her to you know to to take to help that. So they would like hospitalize you at that in that era until you came down from the the mania. You kind of medicate you out of it, and then they would let you go. Yeah, tough tough times indeed back then, but it's good that. It's gotten a little better nowadays, at least I hope so. Yeah, and nowadays it's interesting because everybody, as I was saying, everybody doesn't respond to everything, and so that's why nobody should try to treat themselves. You know, for people who might have a mental illness or know somebody with a mental illness, you need to get treatment. You know, some people do talk therapy, some people do medication and talk therapy. So for some people, medication is sufficient. Some people cannot take any kind of medication. They can't find anything that works, but there are things that you can do. You can change the way you eat. You can, you know, pull yourself up by the pant legs. You can meditate. I meditate on scripture. There are people who do yoga. There are people who do breathing techniques to help them calm down. The meditation where they're just concentrating on their breath and calming themselves down. But if you have a mental illness, we underscore the word illness, you need to find the correct helper. That's true indeed. Not everyone's the same. Right. Not everyone's the same. It would be good if this was a cookie-cutter illness. It's not. Yeah, especially if uh, there's snickerdoodle cookies involved, right? (laughs) I love snickerdoodle cookies. It's interesting that you said those. I love those. Oh, no I do. I love right snickerdoodle doodle cookies. <laughs> no wonder we're talking right now. All right. I love me some snickerdoodle too. <laughs> now, it is interesting for treatment that people acknowledge the illness, and that's to the stigmatizing thing. And for for this, I'll give a plug. I am a member of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, which is NAMI, that people will see. And this is Mental Health Awareness Month. And the mental health um, thing for Mental Health Awareness Month for NAMI is hashtag cure stigma. It is very important that we look at the stigma surrounding the illness so that because if, if people are not afraid of the illness or afraid to be associated with the illness, they are more likely to go and get the help that they need. And the people who are around you are more likely to um, be able to help you rather than run away from you because they're frightened of what they're seeing. Ah. So a magical question I'd like to ask all the guests is if you – kept all of your gained knowledge, experience, knowledge, and wisdom, and you were 25 again, but this time in the current year of 2018, what advice would you give to yourself? Okay, I have to get myself back to where I was at 25. Okay, I really started working on myself at 27. 
at 25, if I knew what I know now, I would have said, Sharita, go work on the psychic baggage because I was doing everything that I needed to do as far as medication. And I think at 25, that was after I had um, taken myself off of medication because I didn't need it and gotten sick again. So what I would say is get rid of the psychic baggage. Get rid of, you know, anything that could rear its ugly head. Get rid of that stuff so that that stuff becomes powerless in your life, is what I would tell 25-year-old Sharita. And she did it at 27. But I, if I had known it at 25, I would have told her to do it then. And, you know, that she could come out of her box, she'd be okay. There you go. Come out of her box like it's Christmas. <laughs> like it's Christmas. I like that. <laughs> That's right. Come on out here. Or as my husband who is now deceased, he used to say, he was a motivational speaker, and he used to say, you know, everybody, he believed that everyone had gifts, and he would say, bring it on out here to people. Just bring it on out here. Don't hide what you have. You know, and some of us do have a little crazy in us, but that's okay too. You know, bring it. Bring what you have. Come, come as you are. If we could be more compassionate, to one another, then it'll be better. And hopefully, Don, me sharing this story will help people to understand that, you know, your life's not over because you have a mental health diagnosis if you do what you have to do. There you go. There you go indeed. And with that, when you said there you go, I thought an acceptance is important. You can't heal what you don't accept. You have to go, okay, and that's the quote for the book, Define the Verdict of My Bipolar Life. Um, Norman Cousins, who is an author, said, don't defy the diagnosis. Try to defy the verdict. So the diagnosis is what it is. It is. That is as it is. Let that stand. But do what you can do so that the verdict, the death knell, the whatever, would be coming as a result of that diagnosis, fight it. Fight it with all you have. Fight it with both hands and legs. Don't go to WebMD. Yes, yes, yes. Fight it with everything you have. And get somebody. Find somebody who will stand with you. You asked about my girlfriend, Penny. She stood with me. My oldest sister, Valerie, if she she can hear me getting manic over a telephone, and there's actually now through the National Network of Depression Centers, they're working on an app to put on phones so that people who care about you can hear the difference in your voice when they talk to you on the phone if you're getting depressed or getting manic. My sister had that naturally from God, that she could hear that in my voice. And so, you know, she could intercede. But it is good to have at least one person who you can be accountable to, who loves and supports you. And it makes all the difference. You know, in, in the chapter that you loved with Penny, I said that use the Carol King quote, ain't it good to know you've got a friend. There is a proverb that says your friend is your needs answer. It's not a biblical proverb, but it's a proverb that says your friend is your needs answered. And if you don't have a friend, I would say pray and ask God to send you one. And I'm not being silly. I'm being absolutely serious. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Pray for a friend and then show yourself friendly. Yes. Yeah. Don, say that again. (laughs) That's right. Pray for a friend and show yourself to be friendly. Show. That's right. Because you just, you just hit something so important. People think, I don't have any friends. Well, you're not friendly. Be friendly. Try it a little bit. Somebody will glom onto your energy. And I'm not saying that everybody in the world is your friend, because I'm a friendly lady. But I don't have the energy to have 56 friends. Facebook, you have those people that are Facebook friends, but those are not your friends. I mean, some of them are your real friends, but, you know, those are Facebook friends. 
And we get so caught up now sometimes in stuff that we don't realize the importance of having a real person. Like my girlfriend, Penny, is, if she likes to say, across the pond. But she is my friend forever. My friend Desiree, who is here, is my friend forever. My friend Joanne, my friend forever. One of my closest friends, her name was Barbara. And Barbara passed five years ago, unfortunately, because as a result of cancer and the, a cancer that metastasized. And she lived a, wh- a long while, but it eventually metastasized, and she unfortunately passed away. And so for me, I have had some people that really love and support me. And then I have a woman, Dorothy Hurst, who is my, my mom calls her. My mother doesn't call any of her children, doesn't call anybody her children's other mothers. But this woman, my mother calls my other mother. So that's how she got to be my other mother. You have to have community. Well, speaking of community, I'm pretty sure there's folks who want to keep in contact with you and keep up with what you're doing and where to find your book and all that good stuff. So how can we keep in touch with you? Okay. You can keep in touch with me at defyingtheverdict.com. SharitaColeBrown.com, DefyingTheVerdict at gmail.com, 410-585-5721. And the book will be available in bookstores on June 5th, 2018. So when this comes out, it will already be available. I am going to be touring with the book. So I'll go to different places around the country. We don't have that scheduled yet because, as I said, the book is not out yet. But I really look forward to speaking to people. Just let them know you can do it. You know, you can make it. It's a a we situation. It's not trite, that song that Michael Jackson sang, that we are the world, because we really are. And so, you know, if people want to contact me, The book is Defying the Verdict. I am Sherita Cole Brown, and I really love people, and I don't believe that what happened in my life is an anomaly or a one-shot deal. I believe it can happen for you, too. Woo-hoo. Well, there you have it, folks. Keep in contact with the wonderful Sharita Cole Brown. She's got a book tour coming up. Be sure to buy a copy of the book. Heck, buy 10 copies of the book. Have her sign all 10 and bring her some yes. beautiful cookies, too, while you're at it when you see her. So that way she'll have some sweets while you're signing the book, and then you'll get brownie points. And, Don, you can pre-order. At Amazon, well, it's, it'll be, the book will be out then. You can you can order the book on Amazon. Everybody gets it at Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can you can find this book. You can find this book, and I would love to meet you. If I come wherever you are, I would love to meet you because I love people. Hey there, buddy. Looks like you made it to the end of this episode. Since you made it to the end of this episode, do both of us a favor and stop being greedy. Stop it right now and share this episode with your friends and your fellow podcast lovers. Especially those who have book clubs and want to listen to the authors who write some amazing books. Be sure to check out the rest of the backlog too while you're at it and share all those too. And in order to make the rest of your week the best of your week, remember to 